Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 22, we'll read through verse 39 in the New International Version. A message entitled, Resurrection Power. I want you to say it, Resurrection Power. Say it like you mean it from your innermost being. Resurrection Power, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to me, Jesus of Nazareth, was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, to you by miracles, pardon me, was accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. Say that with me. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Verse 33. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ and when the people heard this they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles brothers what shall we do and Peter replied replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off and all whom the Lord God will call. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're going to do tonight, what you did earlier today, God. Your grace, it's being poured out upon us. We ask that you'd give us living understanding tonight. We pray that you would speak to us beyond, the, beyond our normal finite minds, that you'd speak to us with great clarity, even giving us an impartation into our spirit, that we'd be forever changed. You'd renew our minds. You'd help us tonight. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I figured since it was Easter, we might as well go for another resurrection message. All of human history has been changed, or affected, should I say, by what happened on this day that we celebrate this day some 2,000 plus years ago. All of human history. All of human history, yes, all of human history has been changed by what took place in a small town in Israel. Jesus rose from the dead. Come on, somebody say, he lives. He lives. When you read the Gospels prior to this text, you realize that Jesus was crucified on Passover. When I began to study this as a new believer and began to be, hear messages and, and, and study and learn to understand that the Lamb of God, as John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, God's Lamb was crucified the very time that they killed lambs in, in honor of, in observance of, I should say, of the Passover on Friday when they killed the lambs, one for every family, as is a custom, 
in Judaism, that is when God's lamb was killed on a cross. Now, do you think that's a coincidence? It is not a coincidence. It's representative of the truth and the pattern that he set, even from the Old Testament into the New, that Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so as all the Passover lambs are being killed, I hope you have notes. If you don't, bring your attention to the ushers and they'll bring you a, a copy. As the Passover lambs were being killed, so Jesus died on the cross, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And on the Easter Sunday, as we call it, he arose and 40 days appeared to his disciples thereafter. He ascended and commanded his disciples to stay in Jerusalem until they were filled with power. So he ascends and then he appears for 40 days and he tells them all, don't go anywhere until you've got the power. Come on, somebody say, I got the power. All right, good. Then you can go if you got the power, but if you don't, you better not. Amen. And so 50 days after Passover, and you can count it from, from Friday, count 50 days forward, it brings us to, anybody know? Pentecost. Pentecost. And this is the time when Peter is preaching this message that we read in out of Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches to the crowd, and what a message he preached. And if we look at the text that we, that we read Peter's message, Peter explains what just happened. He talks about Jesus, did miracles, signs, and wonders, explains that there were wicked men, explains that he was the Lamb of God, that God knew what was going to happen, that God put the sin of the world on him. He explains the whole story of the Messiah in his message. And, but the core of his message is verse 23 and 24, and you can turn that. Look at, look at verse 23 and 24 of Acts chapter 2. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. The help of wicked men, you put him to death by nailing him on a cross, verse 24, but God raised him from the dead. That is the core of his message. It was the core of his preaching on that day. And he refers to David's prophecy. Look at, see, the disciples of Jesus witnessed the fact that he came to life in verse 32. He says, we saw it. We, we were there. We, we knew. This morning I talked about how all of this took place really in a small town. Anybody grow up in a small hometown? Okay, you, you pretty much knew everybody in the hometown. Okay, that's kind of the way it was. So, you know, Bubba on the other side of the tracks, everybody knew Bubba. Yeah. <laughs> Our first pastor was the island of Molokai. I'm just telling you, people didn't even know their addresses. You say, where do you live? Oh, bro, you know the house, the yellow one. It's just pass that one, bro. You know the big cocoa, that one, pass that one. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, when Peter's talking about this, it, I mean, granted, it's a city, and, and at this time, there were thousands and thousands of people there, but it's something that happened right there. It didn't happen in some far-off place. He talks about how there were witnesses, the result of his preaching. 3,000 people, pretty good altar call. Amen. 3,000 people believe on Jesus. And when you look at this, you realize once again, as I said this morning, the resurrection is the core. It is the very core of Christianity. It's a very central theme of Christianity. It was the centerpiece of all apostolic preaching. Let me read to you some of this text. I mean, you, you read through Acts and you read what they preach. They preach Jesus Christ crucified and rose, rose again from the grave. That's what they preach. Every message, that's what they preach. You know, I, I'm told that that's not the case in some places. You, know, you, don't, you don't just need a good, a good, you know, pat on the back and an encouraging word. We need that too. But you need to hear the truth, which is that, that we are all separated from God because of sin, but we are, we are healed. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. He became a propitiation for our sin. He purchased us by his own blood. And as a result, in his resurrection, we even, even exemplified and, and modeled through baptism are raised again to life. That's what it is to be made a new creature. That's what it is to be born again. You must be born again. You can go to church all your life. You can listen to Christian TV all your life. You can read the Bible every day, memorize whole chapters, and still, if you've never made a decision to believe on the Lord Jesus and repent of your sin, it won't help you, really, ultimately. Eternally, it won't. 
Oh, you'll have wisdom. You might know the right answer. But you, you, you know, it's not right answers and wisdom that gets you to heaven. It's by believing on the Savior and repenting of your sin. The centerpiece of all apostolic preaching is the cross. Acts 3, verse 14 and 15. You disowned the holy righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and were witnesses of the same message. Again, Jesus rose again from their grave. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, man, he's saying this a lot, isn't he? Said to them, rulers and elders of the people. Verse 9. If we're being called to count for an act of kindness shown this man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, verse 10, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, who God raised from the dead. I mean, how many times are you going to say it? Why, why would he say it so much? It's because it is the absolute core of Christianity. I mean, this is the biggest high holiday of Christianity there is. Today, right now, Resurrection. Resurrection Sunday. Acts chapter 5 and verse 30, and the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead. Well, is he saying it again? He's saying it again. Raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Verse 31, Acts chapter 5, 31. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses. That's the other thing he keeps saying. We saw it. I saw it. Wow. Acts chapter 10, verse 39. We are witnesses. Is he saying that again? Why would he say it so much? Has anybody ever seen something like totally phenomenal? When you see something absolutely extraordinary and phenomenal, you can't stop talking about it. And that's what he does. We're witnesses. Man, we saw it. He, yeah, oh yeah. Cross, the whole thing, dead, yup, pierced side, saw the whole thing. We came, actually, it was, it was that woman, Mary, you know, the one that got set free from all the demons. She was like, yeah, she saw it. We saw it. We're witnesses. Wow. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody say it. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 13, verse 29. And when they carried out all that is written about him, they took him down. For, are they actually talking about the crucifixion again? Imagine that. All was written about him. They took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But, gee, but God raised him from the dead. Well, it's like in every chapter. The resurrection is Christianity. We're not talking about, like I said this morning, not a bunch of rules and regulations. Look, we don't need a bunch of rules and regulations, or I should say, you know, we're thankful for them. And, and the Ten Commandments, praise God, they show us what sin is. We do need them. We need the Word of God, thankful for the Word of God. Instruction and correction and reproof, all of Scripture is God breathed. Thank you for it. But none of those things save you in and of themselves. You have to believe on the, on the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Easter is not about the bunny. I know, it's shocking to some. I will never forget... Uh, being the Easter Bunny in one of our egg hunts, Minister Chris, is probably three or four years ago. Six foot one, 260 pound Easter Bunny. And I didn't really know what I was getting into. We had people actually leave the church over it. Um, because, you know, the bunny is a picture of fertility, has nothing to do with the resurrection. Well, I understand that. Anyway, we enjoy reaching the lost, and, and it's one of the ways that we do that. Easter bunny and Easter eggs and all of that. And so I had this Easter bunny suit on, and there was, I don't know, I mean, like, no exaggeration. By the time I put the suit on, it was towards the end of our event, but there had to be 800,000 people. There was 1,000 people or so. I mean, it was a huge event. There was 2,500 or so, so it had thinned out a bunch. Jenny, you might remember it. There were some pictures taken of me. It was terrifying. Hopefully I didn't give any kids nightmares. But I put this outfit on and I'm saying hi to all the kids and greeting all the children and, and they're taking pictures with the giant Easter bunny and, and you know, it's all great. There's only one thing that most people don't realize about those suits. Although my son is acutely aware of it. They're really hot. No, 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 I mean, you don't understand what I mean, really hot. I mean, really hot. 
and there is no oxygen, very little. You're breathing, it's like breathing through a straw, and you're sweating through, I mean, you're just sweating. It's horrible. And I'm starting to get dizzy. I'm sure I was dehydrated, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting dizzy, and like, you know, kind of seeing spots a little bit, and kids are coming to take a picture with the Easter, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, what? it's a nightmare. <laughs> and I finally, I couldn't take it anymore, and one of my staff at that time, Crystal, uh, Crystal Rappi, had been a, uh, a mascot. And so she knew exactly what it was like to be trapped in one of those suits. And you aren't trapped. I wanted to pull, my, I wanted to pull the hat off, you know, the, the Easter Bunny thing. But then they said, don't do it. You're going to give kids nightmares. <laughs> Out comes this bald, sweaty guy. Ah! <laughs> Terrible. So she comes up to me. I think I'm about to black out. I mean, really, I'm seeing spots and I can't breathe. And I'm like praying in tongues, asking God to help me. And she says, Pastor, are you okay? I said, no. She says, I'm going to help you. I said, help me. And so we start kind of walking off. And she's going to bring me to sit me down. And as we walk off, one of these mama bears. Come on, how many of you, how many of you moms, if somebody messes with your kids or messes up their thing, you're going to say something, you're going to do something about it. All right. So I start walking off and she says, Mr. Easter Bunny, how dare you walk away? We've been waiting in a line for a photo. I said, I need help. She's all, we need, what? I said, I need help. She says, oh. And she's like, he's got to get out of this suit, you know, and they kind of walked me over and sat me. This probably has nothing to do with the message. And, 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 and sat me down. And as I sat down and just calmed down a little bit, they began to take pictures with all the kids, and the kids would sit next to Easter Bunny, and I'd pray quietly in tongues as I put my arms around them, and they turned. I prayed in tongues over hundreds of kids with the Easter Bunny outfit on. Don't tell me it's like a Trojan horse. Come on, Jesus. But Easter is not about the bunny. I'm, I have one at home. I'm going to eat it. I know it's not about that. 1 Corinthians 15. The bunny, the bunny, who ate the bunny, the bunny, the bunny, who ate the bunny, the bunny, the bunny, who ate the bunny. And all the kids, all the kids said, Amen. First Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ not be raised in your faith is futile. What does it mean to be futile? Useless. Stupid. How about that? If he didn't rise again from the grave, then, then what, we've done, what we're doing is just foolish. And you're still in your sins, it goes on to say. So Easter is not about the bunny. It's not about the Easter egg. It's about the resurrection. It's not about it. It's, you know, Christianity is more than a set of moral principles and rules. It's about a savior. Amen. And Jesus can't forgive you, can't forgive me just based on you wanting to be forgiven. You listen to me. Listen. He doesn't forgive you because you just want to. Like, okay, I'm ready, God. I'm ready for you to forgive me. That's nice. I'm glad you're ready, but that's not what gets forgiveness. You know, you're not forgiven just because you want to be forgiven. You know that. He's a righteous judge. Can, can, I, can, I, can I try to explain that for a second? You see, he has to deal with your sin. He has to deal with the, the, in the entirety of mankind's sin, past, present, and even future. He has to deal with it. And it's not just because you can ask for forgiveness because you feel like you want to be forgiven. That's not why you're forgiven. You're not forgiven because you asked. You're forgiven because the price has been paid. Amen. Because your sin, my sin, demanded justice. It demand, look, our sin demands justice. You have to pay for it. And the truth is you can't. But he can. The beginning of time, Adam and Eve sinned and God set up the sacrificial system right then. He said, well, I don't see that in the Garden of Eden. Well, in the Garden of Eden, they were deceived. And it says that the Lord God came looking for Adam. And God's looking for you and he can't find you. You're really lost. <laughs> Actually, what it was, I think it was, a, I think it was an opportunity. He says, Adam, where are you? I think he was giving Adam an opportunity to repent. That's what I think. And Adam hid. And when the Lord God takes them, he throws them out of the garden. Before he does that, he covers their nakedness with animal skins. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, you go look and it says, and he covered their nakedness with animal skins. They tried to 
cover their nakedness with fig leaves or whatever, you know? That's religion. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is religion. You try to cover your sin. You try to cover your sin with stuff. Your, your, your righteous deeds. That's exactly what a fig leaf is. No matter how righteous you are, no matter how pretty or handsome you are, no matter how much you do, even to the surrendering of your body to the flames, it will not cover your nakedness. Only God can cover your sin. Only God can cover your nakedness. And in the case of Adam and Eve, he did it with animal skins. And I would venture to say, based upon the scripture and the Lord, now we don't know because it doesn't say specifically, but I think they were covered with the lamb skin. That's what I think. And right from that time, the sacrificial system is set in place. And you see God trying to bring in a people. God trying to cover their sin. And the, what it showed, he wanted the family. He, he wanted to gather his people. He wanted to walk with them in the cool of the day, just like he did with Adam, just like he did with Eve. But man couldn't do it. They wanted the king, and the king failed, Saul. He wanted to be their king. He wanted to be a theocracy. But they, wanted, they demanded the king like the pagan cultures and Throughout history, you see God reaching and man failing. God would reach, man would fail. And finally, the Lord in fulfillment, even of what is called the proto-evangelum. God sent his only son. The first time the gospel is preached is right when man sinned in Genesis 3. The seed of the woman will crush the head of Satan. You will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. It is singular. It's very clear what it's saying. It's saying that there will come from the lineage of Eve, millennium later, one born who will finally crush the head of Satan. And that man, fully man, fully God's name is Jesus. Yeshua. The resurrection of Christ as a historical event, says we are all witnesses. Peter denied the Christ. If you read the story of Peter, now he's putting his, his life on the line and preaching Jesus as the risen Lord. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Peter, the fisherman, curses Jesus, denies him three times, and rrr, rrr, rrr. I'm getting good at that because I got one of my two of them in my backyard. The rooster crows, and Peter's like, oh, snap! I did exactly what the Lord said I was going to do. I denied the Lord. Eventually, he's restored. And he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, how is it that you take a Peter who is cursing and denying the Lord and running for his life, and he now comes out and preaches till 3,000 people get saved? Something happened to homeboy. Something happened to Peter. Something happened in terms of what happened. He'd seen the risen Lord and he got baptized in the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's what happened. Other disciples moved from hiding and running to boldly proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. And the truth is, they all died as martyrs except one. John, the beloved. They boiled him in oil. You want, to, you, listen, you want to build your faith? Go get a book. Brace yourself when you get it and read it. It's called the Fox's Book of Martyrs. It used to be mandatory reading for anybody that like got saved. When you're saved, you go to church, you're like, get a Bible, get the Fox's Book of Martyrs. I don't know why we don't emphasize that more. Because you think you got it bad. You think you're in suffering now. Suck it up, buttercup, and get the Fox's Book of Martyrs, man. And go read it and realize what whiners we are. And in the stories of what God did through these saints, all the apostles except John. But John boiled in oil. How do you boil a guy in oil? They tried to kill him. And he's like, hallelujah. You know, it's like fried, fried John, but he, but he didn't die. How do you get boiled in oil and live? God, God preserved him. What would take a cursing sailor Peter who goes and eventually... He's crucified, he's crucified, but he says, I cannot be crucified like my Lord. That's no good. Hang me upside down. They crucified him upside down. That's how Peter died. You go look in, at, at the different ones that went in India and the different places that they went. They risked their lives. They, they were killed. They were, they were martyred. How, why would you mur martyr somebody? How would you give yourself to something that wasn't even true? 
Oh, but if you know it and you saw it and he changed you and he, something happened as they were a witness, then you're willing to take a bullet for it. You know it. You can't deny it. The resurrection of Jesus is true. The people knew what he was saying was true. Like I said earlier, everyone could walk to the tomb. The empty tomb stands as an enigma. Even in our culture. They would say, well, some say, well, the disciples stole the body. What? Please. What kind of boneheaded logic is that? The gospel story is true. There's eyewitnesses, 500 people. How do you do a mass hallucination for 500 people? You just sprinkle dust on 500 people. You, you go around the night before and you lace their, you lace their, uh, you know, their hummus or something. What do you, huh? You, you put a little something in their, in their, in their olive oil. Huh? Hello? How do you, how do you, how do you get 500 people to say the same thing? You can't. They all said the same thing. It's amazing. It's not a hallucination. No, the gospel stories are brutally honest. As I said, a prostitute is the first witness. Why would you pick a prostitute if a man was writing, if a man's writing it? Dude, is it going to, mankind, is it going to come up with a story like that? Prostitute, yes, the prostitute is your first witness. Oh, good choice. <laughs> Women couldn't even vote, never mind a prostitute. It's just it's totally like, okay, we're not listening to her. Well, why would that, why would that be the case? Because that's exactly what happened. Oh my, what happened to the body? Here's a couple theories. I usually do this every Easter and I'm almost done and we're going to take communion tonight. Here's, here's what happened to the body of Jesus. These are some, these are some scholarly, I mean, you can't call them scholarly because they're just, I don't know. They're idiotic really. But these are some theories. Some people say that, well, Jesus really never rose again from the grave. They said, where the, where the, you know, Mary and the disciples, they were confused on which tomb it was. And so it's called the wrong tomb theory. No, really, really. They, 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 they're like, they went to the wrong tomb. The Romans took the body or the Jews took the body. And, the, and, and then the disciples, they, they were confused on which tomb it was. The tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Yeah, you'd be able to mess that up. Everybody say, no way. The swoon theory. The chief evidence cited in the support of the swoon theory is the fact that the gospel admits that Jesus was on the cross for only a relatively short period of time. And the argument attributes incompetence and even stupidity on behalf of of Romans who were the greatest murderers of all time. They, they, they knew how to torture. I mean, the crucifixion was one of the most brutal ways to kill people. They knew how to torture and kill people like no one else. I mean, you see all this stuff from ISIS? That's, that's nothing new. I'm just saying that there, there's incredible torturers and murderers. So when they wanted to kill somebody, they did. And for them to not, for them to not kill him, the swoon theory says that basically he didn't die really on the cross. He just, oh, here's another one that's just incredibly stupid. I, 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 it's ridiculous. They said, well, we don't know where he went when he was, you know, those, those ages, you know, after 12 and stuff. So he went to India and became a swami. <laughs> and he learned to slow his heart down. No, really, I'm serious. People actually say this stuff that he could stop his heart. How many of you know there's some people that could actually bring their heartbeat down to basically zero? And so he did that so he wasn't really dead. Yeah, what about the spear going through his side, piercing through his, his lung up into his, the, the, the sack that they say around his heart had become water from duress and stress, and that's why water and blood came out. How, how do you, how do you, what do you do with that? No, the swoon theory is idiotic. And yet there are people that, that claim that that's the truth. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the only way to explain Peter. It's the only way to explain Paul. It's the only way to explain a bunch of, of disciples who were terrified, a scattered bunch of people. They get unified even to their own death. 
that go over hill and mountain, over nations and valleys, and don't stop at anything. It is the only way to explain your life. It's the only way to explain mine. It's the only way to explain what has happened in our own lives, that there really is a God who sent his son Jesus, who died on the cross, who rose again from the grave, so that you and I can have newness of life. It's the only way to explain there's a resurrection. It is the only, the only logical example. Listen, any great scholar that's gone out to study, to disprove the resurrection and disprove Jesus, well, they all end up becoming believers. No, every, no, I mean like sincere, educated person. They study and they write books like Evidence That Demands a Verdict. They write these different books that talk about the risen Savior and how they got saved. How the resurrection affects us today. We're forgiven. Everybody say we're forgiven. You know, you're forgiven if you repent, that is. Amen. Heaven becomes our home. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the what? With the Holy Spirit. We can be healed, delivered from demon power. And have God's new life throw, flow through us. Hebrews 2, verse 14, And as much as the children have partaken in flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Verse 15, And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Come on, Jesus has set us free. Romans 6, 4, read it this morning, read it again tonight. We are therefore buried with him through baptism in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Don't tell me you can't have a new life. You can have one. You just have to receive it. You have to learn. You have to grow in the knowledge of God. You've got to repent of your sin. Be forgiven. And find a good place to go to church like this place. And grow. Renew your mind. Come to find out who he is and who you are. Break off generational curses. Break off generational sin and iniquity. Come against the lies of the enemy. Start understanding that you're made for a purpose. Come on, somebody. You're not a, a chance accident in a chance universe. You're made for a purpose. All well, the devil tried to kill us. Tried to get us to take our own lives. But God's got a plan. God has a purpose for us. He takes the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Anybody, anybody with me out there? So when people see your life, is what I was saying this morning, that we're all to be witnesses. So when somebody looks at you, be like, there must be a God. They look at you and go, but I remember you. Uh, what happened? Jesus rose again from the grave and he gave me new life. I repented of my sin. He came in and changed me. Romans 8, 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit that lives in you. And we too are going to have a new body. I'm looking forward to that. My resurrected, glorified body is totally ripped. I don't know what yours is like. Praise God. Anybody else ripped in the spirit? All right, praise God. <laughs> Ah, we can live holy. Yeah, I got to say with that new body thing. <laughs> let's start from the beginning. Let's let's. No, please play. Please. Thank you, Pastor Alex. What was I saying? The older we get, the more we realize that we're mortal. When I was younger, I thought I could do anything. I know now that I can still do anything. Praise God. Anybody? <laughs> no, but we're mortal. We're not going to live forever. Amen. Anybody, feel, don't raise your hand, but some of you older folks, you know what I'm talking about. We're feeling our mortality. But the good news is that you're going to get a glorified body. We can live holy. We can live what? 
we can live holy. Romans 8, 34. Who's in it condemns? No one. Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life at the right hand of God is also interceding for us. We can live holy. If he's praying for you, the great intercessor, I mean, you know you can do it. I mean, you got the power of the Holy Spirit. You can do it. You can live holy. Come on, say, I can live holy. Yeah. And you know, every decision in this life counts. So when you say no to that sin, there's actually rewards for saying no. Sin's deception is that you'll actually get rewarded or pleasure more than obeying God. The, de the deception of sin is that you, the joy and the pleasure you'll get out of sinning is more than God will give you if you obey. And I'm going to tell you, it's flat out not true. For the wages of sin is death. Can you say amen? Mm -hmm. I believe. Can we sing that again? I believe in the saints communion. That one. Praise God. Ushers, would you come? Let's say communion together and we're going to close our service tonight. Danny Boy, would you grab that? Would you stand it up with us? We're going to take communion. It's an open communion, meaning that anybody can receive communion. It's juice and a cracker, powerful symbols. Uh, but you don't want to just take it like a little snack. Like if you're hungry and you want a snack, this is not the opportunity to have a snack, all right? You say, why is that? Because these are powerful symbols. And the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says that many have fallen asleep. What do you mean, falling asleep? For the believer, it's believers who actually die early because they don't discern the Lord's Supper. This is what this is, communion. They don't rightly discern what's happening right now. So we want to make sure you all understand before we receive communion. As you receive communion, you're saying that you know that Jesus died in your place and rose again from the grave and you believe that it's by his stripes you're healed and you believe that he's coming back. And you're saying, Lord, forgive me for all of my sin and I'm going to live for you. That's what you're saying. But if you know that you're going to go and go do the very thing that you know is wrong, don't come up and have some little religious thing because you actually drink condemnation on yourself. You drink judgment. What? Yeah, you, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. If you know you're going to go and fornicate, you know you're going to go back and do the very thing that you know is wrong, don't take this meal right here. Don't, don't do this. It's dangerous. Hello. It's in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 11. You can go read it. Amen. Do we just wipe out half the church? You all want to sit down now? I hope not. All right, praise God. All right, so you say you haven't been living perfect and you weren't going to repent? Good. You're going to do your best to resist, amen, and live a holy life? Great. Then take communion and fight the good fight of faith and believe, amen? All right, come on, Pastor Alex. Would you lead us in song and uh, begin to come if you love, if so desire from the back row? I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. Come on, begin to come I from that back row right there. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. That we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe
I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name. Jesus was betrayed he took the bread and he broke it he said this is my body which is broken for you in likewise manner he took the cup and he blessed it he says this is the cup of the new covenant my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins and he says as often as you do this do this in remembrance of me so Heavenly Father before you we remember that you sent your son Jesus who died on a cross for our sin his broken body the crown of thorns in his head even for our mental anguish the 39 lashes Lord upon his back it is by his stripes we're healed so we thank you for healing we thank you for forgiveness we thank you that you made a way to redeem mankind as sin entered through one the first Adam you sent Jesus as the last Adam God that sin left for those who believe to be made new creatures in Christ a royal priesthood a holy nation a precious peculiar people called out of darkness into your glorious light the redeemed, the church, the ecclesia of God. So we declare that you're Lord, your Savior, and your blood covers us now. Lord, forgive us. Come on, just ask God to forgive you. Ask him to forgive you for where you've fallen short, where you might have lied or cheated or stolen. Lord, forgive us wrong thoughts, motives, attitudes, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, as the word says. Forgive us, God. Wash us, cleanse us, and make us new right now. Thank you that it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from 
all unrighteousness. So we receive your cleansing right now. Washed and whole, cleansed, healed, free, delivered. Even the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus we are because of what you did. And we remember and declare that you are coming back for your church. And so we stand at the ready. And as the first century church would say, Maranatha, which means even so come, Lord Jesus. Would you say that? Come, Lord Jesus. Come on, say it again. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Let's eat and drink together. The curse of sin is broken. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Happy Resurrection Sunday to you. Let's close in prayer. Would you take someone's hand to the right and left of you if they're not holding a cr crushed cup? Lord, thank you for what you did today. Really a, a historic day for us here at King's Cathedral in Chapels, Alaska. I thank you, Lord, for the fact that you did rise again from the grave. I thank you for the hundreds of kids and hunt kids and adults that gave themselves to Jesus today. Help us to disciple them. Help us to reach them. Lord, bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon them. Lift up your countenance towards them. Be gracious to them. Keep them and give them peace. In Jesus' precious name, amen.